Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to, uh, to my talk. And also thanks to Shankar and Ishan for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll start um, by expressing the sentiment that we heard at the uh, concert yesterday by, uh, by the musician. Uh, please pardon my mistakes, and I do hope you enjoy the music. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, shear thinning uh, in polymer solutions. And um, we heard the talk in the previous session um, where we saw that shear thinning, uh, that entangled polymer solutions show this beautiful shear thinning. Now, the general impression is that all polymer solutions will shear thin. And I want to show you today that um, these uh, polymer solutions can be a lot more complicated or can dis display all kinds of other interesting behavior. And um, that's the problem. If you give me a polymer molecule of a certain uh, molecular weight today uh, and a certain solvent at a certain concentration, it's very hard for me to be able to predict what the solution will do at st in steady shear flows. Will I get shear thinning or thickening or shear thinning, thickening, and so on? It's hard to tell. Okay? And the reason is that we don't have constitutive models yet that span uh, the entire range of uh, polymer concentrations. We have constitutive models for dilute solutions, for uh, entangled solutions, but in this crossover between um, dilute uh, through the semi-dilute regime to concentrated solutions and so on, um, we don't have a model that does everything. Okay? And that's what my talk is going to be. It's going to be about constitutive modeling, um, not so much about uh, simulations. And I'll try to show some uh, uh, comparison with experimental data, uh, in a sense, uh, towards the end of my talk. Okay? So that's, um, uh, that's a basic idea. But uh, more than really shear thinning, uh, and because I'm going to be talking about constitutive model building, uh, the, um, the real question in, in these systems is what happens to hydrodynamic interactions uh, between polymer molecules. Okay? So I'm going to take a very simple system. Um, we are, um, the, the simplest um, um, the, uh, the system that we can consider with uh, keeping hydrodynamic interactions in, and that's a polymer solution with a very long, flexible molecule, um, and with just hydrodynamic interactions. So the only interactions that, uh, that are there are chain connectivity and finite extensibility, and then intra or intermolecular hydrodynamic interactions, and of course thermal fluctuations. All other interactions I throw out uh, just for the sake of simplicity uh, at this stage. Okay? So we are really looking at phantom chains because there are no excluded volume interactions. Okay? So polymer chains are perfectly welcome to cross themselves or cross each other. So uh, these are all phantom chains. And this whole system, therefore, uh, really represents a polymer solution <coughs> close to the theta state where um, uh, the, the conventional um, um, thinking is that excluded volume interactions do not uh, matter much. Okay? So, uh, and uh, again, because there are no excluded volume interactions, there are no entanglements. So I'm basically looking at really an, uh, unentangled solutions of flexible polymers for all concentrations. Okay? So this, uh, well, realistically, as I said, these are theta solutions at concentrations about till about 10 uh, C by C star, or 10 times the overlap concentration. Okay? So that's the case I'm going to uh, consider. And uh, we, uh, we know uh, what hydrodynamic interactions are. So, so if you take a polymer molecule, the segment is constantly moving around. The segment exerts a force on the fluid around it. And therefore, uh, there are velocity uh, perturbations that are propagated by the uh, fluid. And this leads to a coupling of the dynamics of any one segment to all those segments all around it. Okay? So there is a correlation there are correlations in, in, uh, in behavior between this segment and all around it because of these velocity perturbations. Okay? So that's uh, what hydrodynamic interactions leads to. And we know that dynamical properties um, depend very strongly on um, uh, hydrodynamic interactions. For example, the friction, the average friction of a polymer chain depends through hydrodynamic interactions on um, the, the, the conformation or the stretching of the polymer as well as the concentration. If there were no hydrodynamic interactions, for example, um, uh, then you wouldn't have uh, any uh, conformation dependence or any dependence of the friction on the shape or the presence of other chains in the system. 
Okay, so that's what uh, hydrodynamic interaction leads to, and I'm going to talk about this model in the context of um, this space, right? So I'm interested in uh, trying to understand what happens to hydrodynamic interactions in polymer solutions when you put them in a strong flow, right? And strong flows tend to stretch the uh, polymer uh, molecules out. So we're looking at what happens um, uh, in the space of the stretch ratio, which is basically, basically the end-to-end -end distance divided by the um, um, the equilibrium size of the polymer molecule, okay? That's the stretch ratio. And then on this axis, I have the concentration ratio, which is the concentration divided by the overlap, critical overlap concentration, okay? So <clears throat> at this point, we have an isolated polymer, zero concentration at, and at equilibrium. And as you go along this axis, then at when uh, C by C star is equal to one, you get uh, uh, critical overlap and the, beyond this, Usually, is call, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, regime is called the semi-dilute regime, okay? In terms of uh, uh, this axis, as I go from here to here, when the molecule is completely stretched out, right, then this ratio becomes equal to the square root of the number of Kuhn segments in the molecule. So that's the upper limit for finite chains, okay? So <clears throat> that's the space I'm, I'm going to look at. Yeah. Um, and we already have, in fact, a lot of theory available for bits and pieces of that, uh, of the, uh, in that space. And that's what I'm going to try and synthesize. There's, I, I, uh, um, uh, the, uh, there's nothing really original other than putting everything together in, in, in all this work, okay? So here in this, uh, uh, we already know, for example, that this line here is the dividing line between uh, a dilute solution where there are no interactions at all between any molecule, whether it is stretched or not, yeah? And then here in this region, you have uh, some hydrodynamic interaction between the molecules, okay? And that comes from, uh, again, um, uh, uh, um, the beh behavior of rods and so on, where we know that uh, if, you, if you draw a sphere surrounding a stretched rod-like object, then um, uh, if the concentration is uh, below that overlap corresponding to those spheres, then you don't have even hydrodynamic interactions strong between uh, these kinds of partially stretched chains. So that's a dividing line between dilute and non-dilute systems. Um, <coughs> so uh, here, on the other hand, right, we have for coils, for e uh, equilibrium coils, as I said, this is the uh, uh, critical overlap condition, and here we have what is called uh, a screened hydrodynamic interactions. And that's an important phenomenon, uh, or the phenomenon of hydrodynamic screening is something that's what I'd, uh, I'd like to understand. What happens to hydrodynamic screening in this region when mole molecules partially stretch out and begin interacting hydrodynamically? That's a question that uh, we've been, I've been trying to understand. Okay. And um, here, uh, uh, before I get to that, uh, let me uh, t tell you, uh, 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 introduce a very important uh, um, parameter in the model, and that is uh, the friction coefficient of a single Kuhn segment, okay? So that, uh, um, it's, uh, it's not easy to measure in an experimental system, and you can represent the friction coefficient of the Kuhn, uh, uh, Kuhn segment in terms of its hydrodynamic radius, okay, which, I, which, I, which I'll denote as AK, and um, the strength of the hydrodynamic interactions depends on, um, in the theory, in, uh, uh, can be described in terms of this dimensionless parameter, which is just the hydrodynamic uh, length divided by the Kuhn length of the segment, and there's this Usually for consistency with older theories, uh, there is this uh, uh, square root of pi that comes in, okay? So this is effectively the uh, dimensionless hydrodynamic uh, radius of a single Kuhn segment. So that's one uh, important parameter in the theory. Now, if you complete, as I said before, if you completely turn off hydrodynamic interactions, right? Then chains do not recognize each other. They do not uh, care whether they are stretched or not stretched. The friction coefficient is always constant. The friction coefficient of the entire chain is just the sum of the friction coefficients of all the Kuhn segments, okay? So, and that's independent of whether the chain is stretched or, or um, uh, the presence of other chains. And that is called the Rouse limit or the Rouse chain, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, in, in the case of uh, dilute systems, the effect of HI is understood 
uh, or explained usually uh, using this concept of draining. Okay? So and the, the idea of draining is that um, when you have a polymer coil, the hydrodynamic uh, perturbations effectively shield the interior of the coil from the flow uh, of the solvent. So basically, as far as the solvent is concerned, the solvent sees this whole coil, coil as an effective sphere. Right? And so that kind of a, a, a behavior um, is called the non-draining um, 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 uh, sphere. Basically, this, uh, the, uh, the solvent cannot drain through the uh, polymer coil. Okay? So this uh, shielding effect is, uh, is, is a consequence of hydrodynamic interactions. Of course, if the hydrodynamic interactions are not strong, for example, this whole coil is not long enough, or the hydrodynamic interaction parameter is very small and the interactions are weak, then you have some partial draining. Okay? And of course, you have the ideal case of the Rouse chain, which lets the flow completely through and doesn't recognize the, uh, and the solvent doesn't effectively recognize the um, uh, polymer coil at all. And that's called the free draining chain. Okay? So the Rouse chain is a free draining chain, and at the other end, we have these non-draining chains. Uh, so, in the dilute limit again, uh, you can, uh, for, that is for a single polymer chain, and here I'm looking at single pol polymer chains at equilibrium, we have the Zim theory, okay, for Zim theory for isolated coils, and for Zim theory, you can actually work out uh, the uh, friction coefficient of a polymer chain given a certain number of Kuhn segments and given the hydrodynamic interaction parameter. All you need to do is to take a random walk and you can uh, quite easily calculate the friction coefficient of a random walk. Okay? And you can express this friction coefficient as um, the Stokes drag of the, the, that coil of, of a given size, okay, of a, a random walk, that's the Stokes drag of a random walk, multiplied by this factor, which I'll call the partial draining correction. So for random walks, you can compute this and you can plot this ratio as a function of one by the square root of the number of Kuhn segments. When the number of Kuhn segments is very large, okay, then this goes to zero. In, in this region here, you see that alpha, irrespective of the hydrodynamic interaction parameter, essentially becomes a constant. Yeah? And therefore, the solvent is basically seeing the, sto uh, uh, the, uh, the friction coefficient um, a sphere with a small, con with a uh, constant correction. So the whole coil behaves really like a non-draining sphere for very large chains. Okay? But as you get to smaller chains, then the effect of uh, draining becomes important. So here, for small chains, um, these are all partially draining chains. Okay? And here, in par for partially draining chains, the, hydrodynamic in the effect of hydrodynamic interaction is, uh, or the interaction parameter becomes important. So here, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the non-draining limit, and this alpha is going to keep coming up again uh, later on. Okay? So that's all Zim hydrodynamics for isolated chains, very well understood. Yeah? From now on, I'm going to uh, chuck more blobs at you, uh, um, like the other speakers. I'm going to use blob models to actually construct this model for partially stretched chains. Okay? So as explained by the others, the blobs can be used for all kinds of interactions. And the idea is that if you take chains with some kind of an, in, uh, of an interaction between the different segments, then these interactions tend to introduce correlations in structure. Right? Thermal fluctuations are constantly trying to break that structure down yeah? because, of, uh, th because th the thermal noise is random noise. So there is some kind of a length scale at which the tendency for these uh, interactions to create correlations it becomes equal to the tendency of the thermal fluctuations to break down those correlations. Okay? Below that kind of length scale, random noise wins, and the structure basically looks like an ideal random walk. And above that length scale, you have the interactions winning, and they impose their own uh, order or their own kind of structure. So that's a basic blob argument, and that's va valid for a lot of other interactions as well. So here, um, uh, where HI comes in, or hydrodynamic interactions come in, what uh, we are going to see is that within any, one, any of these blobs, the random structure, the ideal random walk persists, and therefore Zim hydrodynamic persists within any single blob. And beyond those blobs, the hydrodynamic interactions weaken. 
Okay. So first, let's look at what the effect of stretching is. So I'm still in the dilute limit. I'm considering a single polymer chain that's being stretched, that has been stretched by the flow uh, partially. Okay. Now here we have the uh, theory of Pincus, uh, and from there we can actually work out. Um, uh, we have this concept of what I call the tension blob. Yeah. So um, if you uh, apply a force to stretch the polymer molecule, then that force tries to break down the uh, isotropic structure and make it into uh, an anisotropic structure. Okay. So there is a tussle between the uh, tension in the, uh, in the coil that is trying to create this structure and the, ra and, the, and the random noise. And there is therefore some kind of a length scale at which the random noise wins. Okay? And you have ideal random walks. You can work this out. You can connect it to the stretch of the polymer molecule or to the force. And you can, given a particular stretch, you can always calculate the number of these tension blobs and also their, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the size, the typical size of these tension blobs. So when you stretch the polymer molecule, you can, uh, it breaks down or it, uh, you can think of it as an array of these um, uh, tension blobs. And what uh, we've, uh, uh, we've done calculations to show this is that if you take the, um, a, a, a random coil, uh, stretch it uh, to a certain end-to-end -end distance and calculate its friction and so on, then the friction of such a chain is effectively equal or uh, uh, scales the same way as the friction of a bunch of a linear array of these blobs, okay? Or I, I'll call this the tension blob pole, yeah? There's a literature that uh, refers to these kinds of arrays as blob poles, so here we have a tension blob pole. And the, uh, the friction coefficient of a, such, a, uh, such a structure is fairly straightforward to calculate from standard theory, <coughs> and you can work that out using bachelor's theory, for example, and you get the friction coefficient of such an array to be the, um, the friction coefficient of a single blob multiplied by the number of blobs. Okay, this is just the Rouse-like behavior divided by a correction due to weak hydrodynamic interactions between the blobs. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a famous uh, that comes from Bachelor's theory. You and you can get a simple uh, form for this. Yeah? Um, now this blob friction coefficient also you can calculate. Right, remember, as soon as you know the stretch of the polymer molecule, you can calculate the size of each blob, and therefore that's a Stokes drag of a single blob. And then you have this correction coming from the random walk within each blob, right? Partial correction. And that I've already worked out, yeah? If you give a certain number of um, ideal random walk steps that are contained within the blob, and you know what the uh, hydrodynamic interaction parameter is, then I, I know what the partial training correction is from, from Zim theory. So, so I have all the ingredients required to calculate the friction coefficient of a single blob, and given the number of blobs, I know also how to calculate bachelor correction. So <clears throat> that's uh, for a, a partially stretched chain, and here it gets interesting, right? So you can calculate this friction coefficient for a single chain and plot that as a function of the stretch of the molecule relative to its maximum length, okay? Now, if you choose this, a strong interaction parameter, yeah, then you get, as many people expect, the friction coefficient to increase as you stretch the polymer molecule out. This is conventional wisdom. You stretch a polymer molecule out, the friction must increase, yeah? But if you choose a small enough hydrodynamic interaction parameter, then you can actually see the friction coefficient not increasing or even decreasing as you stretch the polymer molecule out. Okay? And this is not um, um, really uh, uh, well studied or uh, well understood. Okay? But you can explain uh, why the uh, blob model predicts this just by looking at this expression that we had earlier. Right? So this is the normalized friction coefficient. It's, uh, if you normalize it, you get this factor of number of blobs. As you stretch the molecule, the number of blobs grows, so that factor increases. But remember I showed you that as you stretch the, uh, um, uh, the chain, the number of blobs increases, the number of Kuhn segments within each blob keeps decreasing, right? So you actually, for per blob, you're going up this axis, yeah? And as you go up this axis, if you have a low enough hydrodynamic interaction parameter, you can see that alpha actually quite decreases quite strongly. And this factor also increases, and it's in the denominator. So the combined effect of this can more than offset the growth due to this term, and you can get a decrease in the friction coefficient of a chain 
as you stretch it. Okay, so that's um, uh, for a uh, for a single chain. Okay, now let's look at uh, what happens when you put multiple chains in. Now, as uh, Ravi mentioned, you get another blob scale, right? And um, so what happens is that you have this single segment uh, inducing velocity perturbations. The neighboring chains are all going to uh, dissipate that uh, the momentum in that those velocity perturbations, right? So beyond a certain length. Another segment here of the same chain can no longer feel the momentum that this uh, um, uh, segment is imparting to the solvent, right, through the velocity perturbation. So the correlation between the motion of some part here and this part actually is much smaller than it would have otherwise been in a dilute solution, okay? And that's the concept of hydrodynamic screening by neighboring chains. And this uh, phenomenon of hydrodynamic screening uh, occurs both in stretch chains as well as in equilibrium coils, although most of the work has uh, been really done only for equilibrium coils. Yeah. And uh, you can therefore work out the length, at, uh, the length scale at which this is the correlation uh, length that Ravi talked about. You can uh, work out the length scale at which the hydrodynamic interactions are still important, okay? and that's the correlation blob size. And the number of uh, these correlation blobs also you can connect to the concentration through this uh, um, uh, through scaling analysis, and you get this very simple relationship for uh, for phantom chains. Okay? And in this case, you have a chain of blobs, yeah. But unlike the bachelor correction, for these this is a completely a Rouse chain of blobs with no hydrodynamic interaction between one blob and another, right? So in this case, you have the friction coefficient becoming just the sum of the friction coefficient of the blobs. We already know how to calculate the friction coefficient of a single blob. Okay? So that's a picture for coils overlapping uh, at equilibrium. Yeah. So that's very well known, uh, as Ravi pointed out. And when you completely stretch out the chains, you have rods and a flow. These rods can be aligned. And even for this uh, case, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of uh, theory and insight available. And you also have a correction that comes due to concentration when you have uh, rods oriented ro rods aligned like this. Okay? So there's bachelor's correction with some additional terms uh, coming from other work uh, in that area. So for, uh, when the chains are completely stretched out as well, you have um, a theory available. And so what we basically done is put all these different relationships together and developed an interpolation scheme, right? So here uh, uh, we know uh, uh, how bachelor's theory works, right? Uh, here we know um, this is all dilute. And in this regime here, we have hydrodynamic screening for coils and we know how that works out. So what we have had to work out is what happened here, what happens here. Now in this region, you basically have now a competition between two kinds of blobs, right? You have, you have partially stretched the chain, so there, is the, there are these tension blobs, and then you have over, a possible overlap between chains, and then there are these co correlation blobs, right? And it turns out that whichever blob is smaller, that blob wins, yeah? And you can work out this line when the two blob sizes are actually identical to each other. Yeah? Below, these, uh, below this uh, uh, line, for, in, for example, if I take some uh, so solution here and I'm, uh, I uh, keep stretching that molecule, right? Here initially, the uh, correlation blobs win because they are the smaller core blob. And as I stretch the molecule, the, the size of the correlation blob, which is only a function of the concentration, doesn't change. But as I stretch the molecule, more and more pinkest blobs appear. They get smaller and smaller until eventually they become the same size as a, as a correlation blob. And beyond that, if I stretch further, then the hydrodynamics is dominated by these stretch blobs, right? So you can, uh, and that for, by, uh, by scaling theory, you can get the location of that line. And from there on, you can uh, use the different scaling um, arguments uh, coming from bachelor's theory and all that to work out the friction coefficient in each of these regimes. And uh, so uh, I won't go into the details of this uh, or the details of the uh, interpolation scheme. That's, uh, that's really quite messy, right? But it's a simple interpolation scheme that uh, allows me to, uh, as I cross from one line to the other, from one region to the other, that keeps the friction coefficient continuous. Not differentiable, but continuous, okay? So um, uh, I have these expressions. 
and that's my algorithm to calculate the friction coefficient of a chain for any given stretch and even any given concentration. Yeah, I given the stretch and concentration, I find the the re regime in which uh, on that stretch concentration plot, I can calculate the number of blobs. Uh, depending on the regime, I can calculate the blob size, and given the blob size, I can calculate the friction coefficient of a single blob. Then once I know the number of blobs, I know the correction factor that depends on the concentration and the stretch, um, and uh, therefore I have the total expression for the friction. Okay. So that's uh, chain friction using blob theory. And the interesting thing uh, is, the, uh, is that, um, uh, th that this, uh, all this analysis tells us that this whole idea that uh, you can uh, separate out uh, polymer solutions clearly into semi-dilute and dilute yeah, uh, without taking into consideration stretching is actually incorrect. Right? So this has been pointed out in another paper uh, uh, on extensional flows by Gareth McKinley and all that, uh, all of them, uh, where they basically uh, argued that if you take a chain here, which is initially dilute, C by C star is less than one, and then you begin to uh, put it in an extensional flow and, and chain stretch out, here, the rheological properties are insensitive to concentration because it's in the dilute regime. Whereas here, if you go here, then you have interactions between the molecules and the, uh, the rheological behavior begin to depend on the concentration. Okay? So here you can get concentration dependence, here there is no dependence. So this they refer to as a self-concentration uh, effect. Um, similarly, you can have a self-dilution effect. If you take an initially um, um, semi-dilute solution where the concentration dependence is strong and then you put it in a flow and uh, begin to stretch it. When you get here, you go into uh, this bachelor region where the concentration dependence is actually logarithmic in the concentration. It doesn't uh, increase strongly with concentration. Therefore, the uh, dependence on concentration here is weaker than when you start with. Right? So semi-dilute solutions can actually self-dilute. Yeah. So that's uh, one key uh, insight that comes from um, uh, all this analysis. Okay, and uh, uh, and the other important thing is about the chain friction dip and how it depends on the on the friction coefficient. Yeah. So recall that this uh, had this plot for a dilute solution where uh, chain friction could actually decrease with stretching. The same behavior carries over when you include concentration effects as well. Okay. So this is large segmental friction h star is equal to 0.25, and that's the curve for uh, zero concentration. As I increase the concentration, I find that the friction coefficient, uh, coefficient still increases with chain stretch, okay? So strong increase. If I take the uh, uh, concentration of C by C star is equal to greater than one, right? You see initially that the friction coefficient doesn't change because it's a rouse-like chain of blobs until the, num uh, the, uh, the blobs begin to, e uh, the stretch blob sorry, the tension blob and the correlation blob become equal to each other, and then it crosses over into that uh, weak screening region where the friction coefficient now begin to begins to increase as a function of the chain stretch, okay? So for this H star, friction coefficient at any concentration increases, increases with uh, um, uh, stretch, yeah? But if you take a weak hydrodynamic interaction, then the uh, behavior at the dilute uh, case of the friction coefficient decreases as a function of the chain stretch that carries through at all concentrations. Okay, and this is a really important difference, right? Depending on the strength of your hydrodynamic interaction parameter, you can have the friction coefficient behaving differently um, uh, uh, with uh, respect to uh, concentration and stretching. Yeah, and that's important for understanding um, what happens in shear flows as well. Yeah. Okay, so so far I've been talking about just the chain friction, yeah? But now we want to go beyond chain friction and get a constitutive model for the polymer stress, okay? And that uh, constitutive model, if you li like acronyms, uh, uh, that's a new co uh, constitutive model we have, uh, B2, C2, D2, okay? And, uh, uh, well, this is, I, I, I should point out that this uh, constitutive model is different from uh, other work on, uh, on closure approximations. Of course, Brownian dynamics will give you the exact results. And then there are there's been a lot of work studying uh, using closure approximations to predict rheological properties in dilute polymer solutions. And uh, people understand uh, what happens in dilute polymer solutions very well. This, is, this, uh, this particular model takes a completely different approach. Basically, you use uh, 
we've used the uh, insight coming from blob models, and we plug all this insight into the friction coefficient in a standard Feeney P model. Okay, so this is uh, the st a simple single mode Feeney P model. You have the evolution of the confirmation tensor, that's a flow dependent term, and then you have uh, the uh, equilibrium relaxation term, and here you have the relaxation time. In the standard Feeney P model, this relaxation time is just a constant, okay? But now we know that the relaxation time depends on chain friction, it's proportional to the chain friction, okay? So rather than keeping it a constant, we make it uh, a function of this uh, confirmation and concentration dependent friction, and uh, uh, we have the uh, uh, blob, essentially, the, uh, this model. Okay, that's a simple idea, and all the calculations that I described earlier, as soon as I know at any instant of time what uh, the confirmation tensor is, from there I can get the end-to-end -end distance or the chain stretch. Once I have the chain stretch, and then once I know what C by C star I'm operating the solution at, right, I can calculate the friction coefficient, plug that in here, and run for the next time step, and uh, evolve to a steady state. The only parameters in this model, um, oh, I uh, left out head star here, head star is important, and then you have the number of Kuhn steps, C by C star, and the Weisenberg number, okay? So given these four, uh, with these four parameters, you can generate predictions for both shear and extensional flows. Uh, I also have a multi-mode version of this, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll skip that, okay? Um, and now, um, uh, do, can we uh, uh, validate this? Yes. Uh, and I'm going to very quickly talk about a validation for in uniaxial extensional flows, okay? One of the really interesting and non-trivial predictions of this model is that in a uniaxial extensional flow, there's this phenomenon called coil stretch hysteresis predicted by Dijon, okay? Uh, in uh, that, uh, uh, at, uh, the, the steady state behavior shows a very, uh, uh, shows a hysteretic uh, behavior. So here's a plot of the mean squared end-to-end -end distance as a function of the Weisenberg number in a uniaxial extensional flow, and you can see these hysteresis loops. As I increase the concentration for going from the dilute limit, and I go to C by C star is equal to one, the hysteresis loop predicted by this model actually widens, yeah? And then when I go, uh, increase the concentration further, yeah, and I go into the semi-dilute regime, then the uh, um, uh, hysteresis uh, loop shrinks and finally completely vanishes. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's a pre uh, first uh, interesting prediction the model made. And then we went and tested this out uh, through uh, uh, uniaxial uh, filament stretching rheometer uh, experiments conducted by uh, Tam Sridhar and his group. And we also, Ravi, uh, Ravi's group also did uh, Brownian dynamic simulations of this. And if you plot the hysteresis window sizes, coming from Brownian dynamics and experiments, you can see that the, uh, they show this uh, peak, uh, they, they go from practically zero to, uh, to a peak and then the hysteresis windows vanish. And those are the curves that are actually predicted by the uh, model uh, for two different choices of this head star parameter. Note that these values are actually quite low um, compared to what uh, people typically use uh, in the literature for the hydrodynamic interaction parameter. But that was uh, uh, um, a good qualitative agreement of this model, it's just a single mode model um, in predicting uh, hyster hysteresis. Uh, uh, we also showed that um, this model reproduces uh, uh, capillary uh, breakup dynamics or Kaber data um, uh, if you put in all this, uh, uh, these arguments, okay? So ca capillary, for those of you who know this, capillary breakup or Kaber is also a, a, a uniaxial extension flow. So how much time? Five minutes, okay. okay. So now let me, um, in the last few minutes, talk about what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, at the beginning, shear thinning, okay? So let, uh, first let me show you uh, experimental observations. These are old data, 1976, and that is polystyrene in decalin, and this is the polymer viscosity plotted as a function of the shear rate, and you can see that for most concentrations, this is at a particular molecular weight, high molecular weight. For most concentrations, you have shear thinning, okay? But then for the highest concentration here, there seems to be some evidence of a shear thickening, yeah? So that is uh, this molecular weight. Increase the molecular weight further. Now you see that at all concentrations, you have uh, uh, viscosity beginning to increase as a function of the shear rate after a, uh, reaching minimum. So you have shear thinning followed by shear thickening, okay? So that is polystyrene in decalin. Now, 
Um, very interestingly, when uh, uh, these, uh, these, all these data were at finite concentrations, when they extrapolated this data to zero concentration to get dilute limit data uh, for intrinsic viscosity, then that extrapolation actually yielded only uh, uh, uniformly uh, shear thinning result. So in the dilute limit, the polymer solution for all molecular weight thins, but when you increase the concentration, you can get shear thickening happening in these solutions. Okay? So that was uh, polystyrene in decalin. And now you have uh, Ravi's data uh, from polystyrene, uh, 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 for polystyrene in uh, DOP. Yeah? And this is data, consolidated data for different concentrations, for two different molecular weights, roughly comparable to the same um, system earlier, uh, uh, 1 million and 15 million. And here you see no evidence of any shear thinning, right? Any shear thinning is probably lost in, in experimental noise there. Uh, shear thickening is lost in that experimental noise there, so it's all completely shear thinning, yeah? Same uh, polymer, polystyrene, similar molecular weights, two different solvents, you get very different behaviors, yeah? Then uh, this is DNA solutions in salt buffer, and here you see some evidence of a shear thickening, yeah, and uh, initial shear thickening and then followed by strong shear thinning, right? So uh, that's uh, DNA solutions, again from um, Ravi's group. And here you have uh, other data that show actually uh, uh, shear thinning, thickening, and then thinning again, yeah? So this is for polyethylene and xylene. And for PEO in ethanol, you only see shear uh, thinning and maybe some kind of a plateau here, right? So Experimental data show a lot of uh, a, a variation in, the, in this behavior. Now, can the blob model reproduce all this? I don't have direct comparisons with experimental data uh, yet, uh, yet. But what I do see is that if you have high interaction, hydrodynamic interaction, then you can get a very slight shear thinning initially, a shear thickening followed by shear thinning. And as you increase concentration, the shear thickening behavior here, the intermediate shear thick thickening actually strengthens, right? And this is something like what we saw in the first set of experiments, right? When you go from dilute to higher concentrations, you get a strengthening of the thickening and before eventually the uh, fading off again, yeah? The thickening goes away and you get predomin predominantly shear thinning, okay? If you have small hydrodynamic interaction parameters, then the behavior, remember for small hydrodynamic parameter, uh, interaction parameter, the friction was always a de decreasing function of stretch. Um, you, you predominantly have only shear thinning, right? There's this one odd case, but otherwise you get uh, only shear thinning if the hydrodynamic interaction parameter is small, okay? And this is Giesecke's like, right? Only shear thinning, whereas Giesecke's model can't re reproduce this kind of a behavior. Okay? And this uh, behavior where you have shear thickening, strengthening, and reaching a maximum at C by C star is equal to one. It does so for the, exactly the same reasons that the uh, hysteresis in extensional flows widens, reaches a maximum at C by C star is equal to one, and then shrinks again. Okay, so these two uh, kinds of behavior are related to each other. So that's uh, that's where we are at. Okay, so what I've basically tried to show is that we can consolidate all blob arguments into a constitutive model. Usually, blob arguments are used for scaling, uh, uh, for predicting uh, scaling exponents, but we can actually uh, get a, a nice constitutive model that you can then put uh, for all kinds of flows. Yeah? And that, I believe, allows us to now test this high idea of hydrodynamic screening, right? So is this, uh, uh, if hydrodynamic screening is there and it's important, what effect does it have on rheological properties? This model will be able to tell us, and that we can verify against systematic experiments and uh, Brownian dynamic simulations, okay? So that's, that's uh, really important to do. And uh, these results actually suggest that segmental friction is in fact important when you get to strong flows, right? When you get uh, at equilibrium for coils, it's not so important, but when you get to shear flows and extension flows, segmental friction can be really important. Okay. Um, and the big advantage with this model is that they're super fast, right? So I can get all these predictions within a matter of an hour, 
for lots for a huge range of molecular weights and concentrations and we can do this for single mode or whatever number of modes you want you can put this model into a, a standard cfd solver for an oldroid b or a fini p uh, solver you can modify that easily to uh, uh, put this model in so you can now begin to do simulations of complex flows and study the effect of concentration on complex flows yeah coming from blob theory i'll stop here i'm happy to take questions thank you Um, you showed how by changing that HK star parameter, we get qualitatively different behavior in terms of uh, shear thinning or thinning followed by thickening. And you also showed experimental data where both are observed. Is there a way to backtrack what HK star is yeah. from experimental data? You can. Uh, so what, uh, and that's, well, that's what I want to do uh, next. What you do is uh, you try to match the model. You fit the model for one uh, one molecular weight, one particular uh, uh, shear rate, right? And once you fit that, then the question is, uh, once I get that value from one set of data, can I predict all the other data in all other flows, right? right? So that, that's the way you, I would test that, and that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, nice okay. talk. Thank um, you. A question about the multi-mode version. Yep. I, th I think there's good reason to believe that the f whether the friction goes up or down when you have HI yep. may depend on the mode number. In other words, you could get um, a thickening behavior in the yep. lowest mode and thinning yep. in higher yes. modes. Yep. And there's not going to be a single yep. uh, behavior for each mode. Um, is, you, you agree with that, I guess. Does that your yes. model account for yeah. that? So you, you, you can actually resolve each mode. And that, again, relates back to what happens to the uh, friction coefficient of a single blob. Right? As, as the mode number increases and the blob sizes effectively decrease, then I get closer to the uh, single friction coefficient. And if that's small enough, then the lowest modes can, uh, or the smallest modes can shear thin, whereas you can get shear thickening prediction coming from the higher modes. Yeah. Uh, so, Prabhakar, about the cable setup, it, now given your knowledge of the concentration dependence, can you extract the dilute solution relaxation time from a Kaber experiment? It's, so as yeah. I understand, yes. the analysis is valid in a regime where the polymer coils are stretched and interacting. Yeah. So you, you can. can use this to... You can, exactly. So um, I showed this, uh, uh, this experimental uh, comparison, right? So this is um, uh, with the... Uh, uh, friction with, with the relaxation time estimated from equilibrium, right? And after you put the blob model, the uh, black set of data is uh, model predictions, the white set of data is CABA uh, results, right? So in, in, uh, in principle, it is possible, you can see that it roughly agrees, it's not uh, perfect, right? But in principle, you can actually go the other way, try to use this as a fitting uh, uh, exercise, and extract out the relaxation time uh, at equilibrium, the true relaxation time from cable data. Yes. Okay, and one last question. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, talk. I, I have a, a question about uh, the different systems you consider because I kind of miss the solvent quality that you yeah. consider initially. Yeah. Yeah. And since uh, the Pincus uh, blob model is inherent in your formulation, yeah. I wonder whether you take only a good solvent condition, as I hope you do, yeah. or you no. <laughs> also use? No, uh, that's, uh, that's a great question. So uh, uh, solvent quality effects have been completely ignored, right? And uh, you're absolutely right. So some, uh, the data that I showed for uh, uh, Ravi's data, right? These are data at, uh, for polystyrene solutions at different temperatures. So they are all at different quali uh, uh, solvent qualities. And certainly for the other data as well, uh, the experiments were constructed at conducted at different temperatures, so they are at different solvent qualities. Now what happens is, if you, we, we can work this theory out by also putting in solvent quality and taking the theta blobs into consideration. It just gets very messy and complicated, right? Um, uh, but what uh, solvent quality typically does is it enhances the shear thinning, right? Because the blobs, in the chain initially starts out expanded, and then as it st uh, stretches out, uh, you have um, uh, increased shear thinning. But I, I think we can predict that with this model as well if you put in solvent quality. But I haven't done that so far. <laughs>
Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Rebecca one more time.